Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be, from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. I'm Jan Pascal, SDSA, and I'm pleased to talk with set decorator Rob Hepburn, SDSA, and production designer Mark Scruton about their collaboration on Netflix's hit series, Wednesday. Rob and Mark, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Oh, God, I have to congratulate you. The sets look amazing. Not only is it a fun series to watch for the content, but the sets are just amazing. Let's start with where did you shoot? I mean, originally we were going to shoot in Toronto, which is how I first met Rob. And we spent a, spent a while prepping it and figuring it out there. And then it kind of really didn't fit and didn't work. And there wasn't enough space and the time was running out. So sort of out of the blue almost, we pivoted to Romania, which was um, a shock, I think, to everybody at the time. Once we got that going, then I realized I needed still needed a decorator and, and Rob was still the best man for the job. So I proposed that he came with me to Romania. Rob, were you able to bring any support? Either of you were you able to bring support with you? Well, Rob was my support. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring an assistant decorator. They allowed me one person. And I spoke to a couple of decorators who had who had worked in Bucharest in, in the past and got a lot of advice. It was a little rocky start, but it, it turned out, I think Mark would agree, it turned out to be really great. Yes, it was all sort of hands to the pumps when we got there, because we were neither of us had shot there before. So it was definitely trying to figure out how we were going to do this. Because it was a show that was set primarily in America, and there was no America in Romania. Lots of Gothic architecture and interesting stuff, but definitely no America. So that was our biggest challenge, I think, was bringing that. How much prep time did you end up having there once you settled on it? It was about 12 weeks when we actually got on the ground, wasn't it? Maybe not even that. I think you'd been there about a month and you were sort of, uh, I think you were keeping the whole thing together at that point. It was Yeah, well, we'd, we'd had a false start. The whole thing had been set up at a different studio with a different production company, a different local production company, and that had sort of gone to the wall. So I had to start again. So I, this was my second art department at this point. <laughs> so I started with my third art department. And luckily, Rob had kind of stayed a constant in that. So luckily, somebody had a vague idea what was going on other than me. But when we actually got into proper prep, it was literally like, you've got 12 weeks. Get to it. So I did, I did two in Toronto, just frantically shopping for Americana. We'd have our police station and we would have... Uh you know, or cedar strip canoes, all, all, all kind of things, you know, you just were not going to get in Romania. And then 10 weeks prep on the ground there. And that was pretty frantic, I'll say. Oh, my God. Well, you really pulled it off. I mean, it looked so amazing. So how, how much did you end up building of the, the Academy of Nevermore? It was sort of a split. I think, you know, the, the immediate response was, oh, we were, you know, lots of great architecture here, we can do a lot of it here. And actually, the way Tim likes to work is he likes to build as much as possible. And luckily we were set up in the end in a way that had lots of space. You know, we had to design stuff without a location a lot of times. So the, the, the kind of casino castle that you're seeing there, we didn't have that when we started designing the school. And we spent a lot of time driving around the remaining countryside looking at castles, which were nearly always rejected by Tim. But eventually we found Canter Casino, which, which we were looking at, and, and that kind of fitted because it had like this core structure in the middle, which kind of had a vague Adams family thing to it. And then it had lots of dead space that we could build our architecture on top of, which was which was really good for us because it meant we weren't tied into it particularly. And we could sort of take what we already had as designs and blend them into that that um, structure, which sort of worked. It was Weems's office and the central entrance, wasn't it? That was the main interior location, Rob. I think, yeah. And then Cante Casino for the exteriors. But then the quad and everything else we built. Oh, wow. Her office was amazing. The principal's office was just incredible. And the drapery, you had me at the drapery. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. The draperies were uh, were pretty awesome. And I think the piece resistance on them was, was putting the big Nevermore logo embroidered on the center. And I thought that was pretty cool. It was exquisite. Absolutely. 
It was just beautiful. Such a fun set. And, and, you know, everything in it was shopped from everywhere. The desk came from uh, just outside of Boston. It was a really interesting piece. It was, it was custom made for a Californian CEO in the 60s, designed and built by an architect and ended up in this little shop outside of Boston. And we found it and like many things, ended up on a plane and we arrived on time. It was so perfect, that desk. It was, I think it's my favorite piece in there because it was, it's so it was such a great mix of that sort of gothic detail and the 60s sort of modernist feel to it, which is what we want to try and get into that space was like the eclectic mix of, of furniture and ornamentation with the gothic. Oh, it was just it was just gorgeous. And then the fireplace was fantastic. Oh, it's so beautiful. That was a thing. We had, we had to sort of build it into an existing doorway. Luckily, there were, there were there was a spare one that which we could sort of block up and build it in front of it, and we sort of we sculpted it part in the workshop and then installed it and, and re-sculpted it when it was there to sort of try and blend it in. Yeah, you can't you can, don't think you can tell it wasn't there before. Most people think it was part of the room until I pointed out we put it in. I mean, it sells the ambiance and and the chandeliers, Rob, were amazing. They were in the location. It's it a beautiful location in downtown Bucharest, but they were none of them worked. <laughs> And many pieces were mixing, missing. So we had a glass blower actually make the uh, shades for us and, uh, you know, just recondition them all. And But uh, they're, they're just so great, such a great asset that they were there. But sourcing all of those craftsmen and, and getting that work done with not much time on the ground, yeah. it's kind of phenomenal. I found one thing that was great about Romania is that there there were craftsmen and there's just still that that sort of sensibility of old world craftsmanship and these old skills and they could really pull stuff off. I think that was a real surprise to us all, wasn't it? That the make the making generally was was very good and very quick. Some of the stuff they turned around for us was phenomenally quick, actually. You know, you asked for it on the Friday and it would turn up on the Monday and you really didn't understand how they managed to get it done, <laughs> which which saved us because I, I didn't wouldn't expect that. And it and it it seemed to happen by magic sometimes. I was so happy with that because, you know, builds were an essential part of this show. And uh, my lead man, Marius, has a fab shop. He has his own studio and a fab shop. And those guys, they just I take something in and say, we need three more of these, like a hospital bed. And they would just knock it out and and perfect. You wouldn't know which is the original. You wouldn't. And that just that saved my butt so many times. I have to say that Enid and Wednesday's room was incredible and the change that you made as Wednesday moved in with the stained glass half it oh, it's just it was just perfect mm. but that, I assume that was a built set right yeah yeah it was, I mean, it was quite a complicated set because they had to have the interior and the exterior and and it was a tricky one anyway because you know a, a, a dorm room that had to sort of withstand eight episodes with pages and pages of of scenes in there, you know, you try and make the space that kind of fitted all the different aspects it had to was 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 hard. And and this sort of split down the middle, which was was always in the script that it was, you know, her side was black and white and Enid's was full of colour. But then we sort of took it to this extreme with the window in the middle and stripping the colour out of it, which which I'd always sort of tried to imagine would be um be, almost be done by magic. But then everyone pointed out that neither of the two in there were actually magic. So we then developed this idea that Enid had, had done all the stained glass herself and then it gave Wednesday a great opportunity to scrape it all off and and as a final act of defiance before she sort of splits the room in half. So um so it worked out all right. And it was a good good handle for the whole space, really, to have that big graphic symbol in the middle. It really sold the whole the whole difference between the two of them. How involved was Tim Burton with you? I, I've actually scouted with him locations before, so I know that it's a challenge. <laughs> He's very quick on locations, isn't he? He's he, in and out before you've even got out of the car sometimes. <laughs> yep. And if he doesn't like it, he's well, he barely even walks in. He walks in and right out the door. No, he you know he was great because he he's very good at being a collaborator. He is not a, he's not a dictator in that sense. He will listen to your ideas, look at your stuff. And, and more often than not, you'll know if it's wrong. And if it's right, it just sort of finds its way into the DNA of the show without you even noticing. It just becomes, you know, another design aspect. So, you know, he, and he's very into it all. And always, you know, everything has to be ready well in advance so he can come in and fiddle and, you know, pair things back. And more often than not, things would be removed and, and 
know, shaped because he, you know, at the end of the day, everything there has to be there for a reason and he doesn't like it, you know, he doesn't like clutter too much. Yeah, he definitely likes a, a quick read on the character through the set. You know, again, the, the extraneous uh, elements aren't aren't required. So I've been watching a lot of his films uh, at that time just to look back on it. And he really does that that sort of tableau shot where it's, you know, you've got the, the actor, you've got the window behind them and some other piece of information visually. And, and that's kind of it, you know, like you really, really quick read, really succinct. And it's really neat to see the way he'll just edit the set, just little tweaks, you know, thing wholesale, just, and I mean, I love, I really love this scene where, where she's uh, interrogating thing. And I just think the framing and, and, and David Landsberg's lighting, it's just beautiful. Like so happy with it. It really is beautiful. And I, that was one thing I was wondering about is how, how did you end up having to accommodate for thing? Cause he's so expressive. He was, he was great. And yeah, between, between uh, uh, Victor, the, the actor who played Thing, and uh, Tom, our VisFX guy, it was an endless dance of just trying to figure these things out. So when Thing is on the bed there, there, we cut a hole in the floor underneath, built a mattress with a hole through the mattress and the whole bit. So because he, you know, he was in, in a blue suit the whole time, except for his hands. So you had this large man, you know, stalking the set, doing these things. And we're always figuring out clever ways, you know, and how many desks do we have to destroy? And how many, yes. you know, it, you know, I find that Tim actually, I think, really simplified a lot of that on camera and made it uh, less worrisome. It was very good. I mean, the interesting thing was that I think that the original proposal was to have a lot more CG hand, you know, mm. rather than real hand. Um, and the more we got into it, the more we realized that Tim did not really want any CG at all. So a lot of stuff that hadn't really been planned to be, you know, a real actor you know, to have Victor there on set suddenly became, hey, how can we fit him behind this filing cabinet? And how can we, you know, have him hanging from the roof and hide him in this ducting? And so a lot of that was very reactive as, as we established this rhythm that actually it was always going to be Victor on set playing thing and you know, very little CG at all, to be honest. So um, there was a lot of running around making multiples of things. That seems to be the way. Yeah. <laughs> And how did you pull off a carnival? Yeah, it was just a big empty field. There's there's not uh, fortunately the the rides were in Romania, but everything else was was a build or, or an import. You know, that was a big five days of dressing in the middle, middle of everything else. And 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 you know, Tim, of course, wants to see it at least two days in advance, which actually is really helpful. I'm shocked that you shot it in Romania because you really pulled off making it look like an American village mm -hmm. and uh, all the way around. I think you really nailed the American aspect of it. The, the mm -hmm. little town of Jericho too was amazing. Is that, did you have to embellish facades or? That was that was a build from the ground up. Ground up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we um, when, I, when we were gonna go to Toronto, we were scouting real towns and that was, because you know, they, they were kind of perfect. But even then, we could never quite find the right one that had all the, the elements in the right place. And Tim was, you know, quite fussy about things being how he saw it rather than fitting into somewhere we were going to, which is always a tricky one. And the minute we pivoted to Romania, it was like, the minute they said it almost, I was like, oh, okay, I can see what's coming now. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, so, I mean, I, I found out on a Friday and they wanted me to show Tim something on a Monday. So I spent my weekend sort of figuring out this town based on this, you know, the, the footprint of land I knew we could roughly get. And we sort of developed it from there, but it, you know, it had to, to do so many things. I mean, it was kind of fun because you got to design everything specifically. So you could, you get the relationship for the weather vane to Kimbot's office, to the town hall, to the church, to the statue. You could figure all that out in advance, which is a fun thing to do on such a big scale. And then, and then Rob had to make it look like it was, you know, America. Interesting thing about that is, you know, there is all these briefs. Make sure you have as many American flags and as much bunting and all the stuff you can have in New England town. And, you know, we started putting some of that stuff up and Tim came in and went, no, we don't need that. We don't need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think he's, you know, definitely he's right. I mean, there's one or two U.S. flags where they need it. Look, I've been in enough New England towns. So, I mean, I think we really nailed it. And it was it was it was no CG top up either. on it. it was all all in camera, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I think there's two shots where they've extended it. And everything else was was built for real, which was which is one of the benefits of Romania. They would let you do that. 
<laughs> it was, <laughs> it was, nobody said no we just kept building and um, it, it works out pretty well in the end but um well did you end up leaving it for them or tearing it down it is still there it is still there the quad and the town are still still there um and i think they're quite nicely doing tours around it at the moment from what i've seen i know we're we're mostly talking about episode one but the the canoes were in episode two were quite fun as well and all the uh, we had a million breakaways and that was quite stressful yeah because uh, global canoe production had um diminished significantly because of covid because we were building we were right on the cusp of the lockdown you know when i first started on it I, we were still in lockdown so trying to get any canoes was almost impossible because most of the manufacturers had you know mothballed the facilities or whatever else so we literally had every canoe we could scrape out of Germany, I think, one manufacturer had that we were, and then we had to change them anyway, they weren't the right shape, so we had to rebuild them and refiberglass them into the shape that we ended up with. Nothing was easy, was it, Rob? <laughs> no, no, nothing. Very little was just off the shelf, you know, or just around the, you know, down the street kind of thing. I mean, what would you say were the biggest challenges, do you think? I mean, aside from everything else you've been through, <laughs> were there any others that I that we haven't discussed yet. Even even our first day, which was which was a pre shoot day, and we shot at the high school. Oh yeah, great location. And we come in and and this beautiful hallway. And Tim is like, I need red lockers all the way down, two hundred feet both sides. And shooting it in, I think that was a week or so away from when we. Yeah, it was yeah a little bit. We we because we'd had some some lockers didn't we and we said well you know we'll do a bank of lockers here and you know maybe yeah. here and it'll be nice and when he was looking at it go yeah yeah it'd be great though if it you know like 2001 where this is just red going off to infinity and we're like yeah that would be that would be really great yeah i, I think we built about 90 percent of those lockers oh in, my God. in a very short time they were they were coming out of the the spray booth you know as we were taking them to the location and, and dressing them yeah, a lot of them are just red boxes with the sort of the, the graphics on the front, but you can't tell which are real and which are fake, can you? No. I don't think you know. Even now when I look at it, I can't spot the fake ones. The effect of it is so brilliant. It, it, he was right, I have to say, looking down this long hallway was just brilliant. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah it's a great call. Yeah. And we love the Nancy bust. Nancy Reagan bust is, is great. Which is now in Tim's garden. He sent me a photo of it the other day. He's now got it on a plinth in his garden, floodlet. I love it. That's fantastic. I know in further episodes, there were a lot of portraits. Did you have, were you able to find artists there to create those for you or? We had, well, we had the, um, the, uh, the monster sort of gallery. There you go. The monster gallery, which, which we just could literally could not generate enough drawings of monsters. I had people in London doing them. We had an artist and just sort of installed in the prop department just I mean who, who I have to say for my shame I forgot about at one point and um and I came back two years later and he's still in there churning out these drawings I was like oh yeah good yes you're still doing that that's great keep going keep going it looked fantastic and then the library in the third episode the downstairs library oh my god well he he goes in there in the first episode as well right yes that's that's a prime example I completely forgot about the nightshade library with the thousands of books and all the portraits on the way down, right? And in trying to source as many original frames as we could, I think, I seem to remember sort of trawling the antique yeah. shops. Yeah, to get to get enough unique frames and not go into, you know, framing, which never never looks right to me, you know, working with new stock. The other issue was, was there was no antique shops, were there, Rob? That was the main thing I think we found. Oh, you're kidding. There was one main antique shop in, in uh, you know, downtown, and uh, I, I, I think I bought every lamp they had and every frame they had. I, I had a buyer working in Toronto pr pretty much full time. Uh, and a bit of stuff in Paris as well, if I remember. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, assistant decorator, she she had the great good fortune to go to Paris and shop the <laughs> Paris flea. Oh. And, and we just it was just a treasure trove. And again, we did a lot of that FaceTime shopping. And it's just I mean, that was that was a real boon. It was like Christmas when the truck came back with all the stuff they got. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it was definitely one of those moments we go, okay, good, we can actually we can do this now. That's you know the, the interesting stuff is arriving. <laughs> I really missed out. I, I wanted to go, but I would have had to quarantine for a week or something when I got back, and I just 
oh my god you don't have time you don't have that extra week no that was that was i mean all the stuff we were doing that whole other element of of covid and and the rules we had to follow and and how hamstrung we were and you know you're like yeah it's just great we're going to be in europe and everything's an hour away and we can go here and do this but and i did shop things that way from rome from paris from london that <laughs> almost all of it was online so that's insane now talk about this which is so gorgeous these figures are incredible i mean as a location this was kind of a no-brainer from our point of view because it was it was just stunning it was one of their military headquarters in the center of town it was a tricky one because it was a very expensive location to facilitate so there were actually more scenes meant to go in there but in the end it, it just became too hard to do it especially when lockdown released and center of bucharest sort of freed up so um so it just got its shining glory in the first episode, and that was it, unfortunately. When you go to, you know, a place like Bucharest and Romania, that's that's really what you're hoping that you know you're gonna you're gonna land. And I think, I mean, Toronto has great stuff, but it it, it doesn't have that space, you know. You know that. No, nothing like that. There you go. And another another one I'd forgotten about, which was the. So this was the about the only space in Romania that had, we could use for the botanical gardens, which had originally it was going to be a big set but it didn't actually feature enough in the end to build anything as elaborate as I was designing but but this this was the one space in the botanical gardens that had the right look um and it was the only place we could actually find that we could take the plant the plants out of everywhere else was sort of everything was dug in but everything in that space was in pots apart from a few pieces I mean it kind of worked well because it did you know we had to design everything around it but again all the all the tables were built from scratch so they matched the radius of the of the space, which again, you know, the Marius and his team sort of pulled that out of thin air. It's just so exciting. What, how did you do this gate? That was, we were, we were so blessed with the studio because it had so many different areas. It had, you know, woodlands over there and it had a bit of a lake over there and some flatland over there. So this was built um, in the woods adjacent to where we were filming in the studio space. And we there was a bit of road and we, we built the, the gates from scratch. They were huge in reality. Luckily, you know, that was my original sketch for them, which we were going to build in Toronto, but we just sort of transferred it to the woods in Romania instead. And the lighting, how, how did the DP deal with all the, the lighting with you, Rob? We did a ton of practicals. There was a mandate to have, you know, Miles loves practicals. I think in Wednesday Nina's room, there's 90 to 100 uh, individual practicals throughout. Um, <laughs> but it's insane. Yeah. And I I, you know, I'll put as many practicals in a in a set as I can if I can. The, the obstacles were more like for the quad uh to get the number of of pendants and massive lanterns we needed to say fill that space. The biggest ones were built by 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 a local sculptor in Bucharest, and they were about, you know, they were five or six feet tall or massive. He built 10 of those. Uh, most of it came, ended up coming from House of Antique Hardware. I'm sure you you know, American company. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great that they had stock and that in it. And I think they arrived a day and a half before we. Oh my god. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was always. I mean, the shipping gods were on our side. It was all last minute, wasn't it? Like the packages and the containers would just turn up just as we were panicking. <laughs> exactly. You just you just didn't know. And again, because of COVID, everything was. You know, no shipping was was not guaranteed. It was extraordinary. A, a lot of things were like those freaking uh, lights in the quad. They were like, yeah, they 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 made it. Just it was it was a funny job for that, wasn't it? Because it was stressful and the time was not against us, and there were so many adverse factors. And yet, in the end, things did turn up just when they were supposed to. <laughs> and then, did they do the conversion to LED that is often done, or did they keep the warm incandescent? primarily warm incandescent fortunately you know it wasn't sci-fi where the entire set is 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 lit by set deck now as you know so with a hundred lights in a in a dorm room that's <laughs> you're pretty much lighting this set. yeah this was this was nearly all lit with candles actually we didn't have any other practicals in there at all apart from you know, the ones buried in the floor which let the the uh the glass jars up but everything else it was a very, very hot set. We literally, everyone, yeah. no one could stay in there for long because I was surprised how quickly the heat built up. We were, we were manufacturing our own double-bit candles because you couldn't get them in Romania. 
That's what I was just about to ask you. Beat me to it. <laughs> is there a challenge anywhere? Literally drilling them out and re, oh. re wicking them to make them double wink. Because, you know, who, who doesn't have the time to do that? Well, exactly. Yeah, we had nothing else better to do at that time. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It might be easier to get a, a permit to have. We can't even light a match in a, in a set without a fire permit. Well, no, that was um, that was one. Funny enough, that was the day before we shot that. There was the massive fire at Pinewood on the Snow White set, and um, and I was sort of panicking <laughs> because the set was kind of you know a lot of polystyrene in there, and and I knew we had you know literally a thousand candles I think on that set, um, plus all the resets plus everything else. So I was sort of constantly sort of going and finding the fire officer and saying, "You're not sitting close enough." <laughs> <laughs> bring your fire extinguisher with you please um, luckily there were no no problems with it so it was all good well it's just uh, it's an incredible challenge but it really does add so much to the scene yeah, you know we could you could go on and on with with this show too i mean i was just going through all my photos the other day of of, of everything my shopping uh, the sets uh bucharest i mean it's just it's an endless tale really just as I say, just when you think you've forgotten it, you remind you remember something else. It's like, oh yeah, there was that. I mean, we haven't even got into making the Adams family limo or oh God, that's right. I'm sorry. You know, we should talk about the 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 cars a bit. I mean, the cut the cars were actually a real surprise because they came up with some great cars. Um and the, the limo we built, it was based, you know, we looked at a whole range of of existing vintage vehicles and we picked the best one as a foundation and then we pretty much cut it to bits and rebuilt it from the ground up. Um, so that that was my sketch based on the, the car that we were going to use. And then, then we sort of rebuilt it from the ground up because obviously it needed a new engine, it needed new suspension. It was it was a complete, you know, the bonnet was about the only thing that sort of lasted. Everything else was custom made in the end. Wow. And this was simultaneous to building everything else. Oh yeah, no, it's just a, a side project to, you know, in case we got bored. <laughs> yeah, in case you were bored. And where were the, where were the, uh, where was the road? Was that in Romania? That or? one they were on at the moment, that was in Romania. That was, um, we spent ages trying to scout for the, the perfect sort of autumn leaf mountain road. And the end, this was the only one that fitted the bill. It was miles away from anywhere. So they had to spend a splinter unit out. It was like a day's drive to get there. And we had to wait for the leaves to turn to be exactly the right point. So we had a scout up in the mountains that was basically keeping a track of them. And it was like, right, now they're at their optimum autumnus <laughs> send, send the crew and they came up. And it was kind of the same with Cante Casino because we only shot at the castle for three days. You know, nobody could quite predict because the leaves were being quite unpredictable when they turned. The two years previously, they hadn't been quite on schedule. So, and Tim was really specific about, I mean, obviously about getting maximum, you know, fall effect from everything. So we had a scout based out there as well, watching the leaves, checking, you know, to make sure that we were going, you know, and, and the, the whole schedule was, you know, sort of ready to pivot somewhere else or, or go out there early if it, if it suddenly changed. But um, I think we managed to get there just at the peak of their sort of beauty. Wow. And what about, Rob, I forgot to ask also about, um, upholsters and drapers did you were you able to find people there to do the that work yeah at uh, um marius's shop we did all the upholstery that we did and the drapery in weems office was was the one thing farmed out to uh, a, a local draper who does film projects there's a huge pelmet frames existing and they were you know falling apart and all the gilding was coming off them we had took those down repaired them regilt them uh, made our templates, uh, craft paper templates off the floor, and it uh, worked out great. The fabric came from London. I uh, had a fabric shopper in London for a couple of days, just pulling samples of velvets. I wanted a velvet that they couldn't do the school purple against the existing wall treatment because of the, the just the color of the red. It just would have been a weird balance. So I found a deep, deep mulberry red that would lean to purple on camera without being the wrong it's not the school purple but it, it it did what i what i hoped it would do so that's a great picture that would shame the um the two armchairs there isn't it because they were so cute those chairs with a great shape to them 
We dyed you dyed the leather on those, didn't you? Which I yeah, I, those 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 were a, f a fabric, and I recovered them in leather, and then uh, our painters went at them and and stained them and turned them this beautiful deep sort of ox bloody purple and those are really cool those are 1940s italian deco chairs that came from antwerp of uh, of all places there's a bit of shopping on first dibs i gotta say so and vin yeah vinterior and first dibs a lot of stuff but they were such a great shape i saw i was always looking for shapes uh wednesday's desk in the dorm is a similar kind of idea it just has this it's kind of feminine silhouette, but also there's just some other essence to it. I don't know. The desk actually, and a lot of stuff in there, you know, reminds me that, you know, so many things we bought, we sort of stripped back and re-dyed or re-stained or seeing Wednesday stuff, you know, everything was turned up in its original color and, and finished. And then we stripped it back and re-dyed it and refinished it to get into that sort of slightly monochrome world. But it, you could always see the underlying textures and the underlying colors and everything, which I thought was a really nice way of dealing with it without just everything being pure black and white. It was always, you know, had a basis underneath it, which was great. The embossing on the, on or debossing, I guess it is, on the edge of the desk on the leather was just, it just added such a beautiful texture. Of course, we had to copy numerous times for the thing to <laughs> be incorporated into it. We did, we did, we did build a couple of those desks in various <laughs> forms to imitate that top, <laughs> cut holes in. I don't know if they got to using them, but we we were prepared. Yeah, no, they did. They did. They did definitely use them. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was great. It just added so much texture. It was just beautiful. Well, I have to say bravo to both of you. It's just a stunning, stunning. It, not only is it a fun show to watch and you know totally out there but it just is stunning your work is just impeccable and kudos for having to do it during covid and with no time at all it's just, what a feat congratulations thank you thank you so much thanks for joining us for this episode of inside the set with set decor don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel and visit our website setdecor.com